This message has been brought to you freely by Ecclesia Kingdom Movement. To support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world, reach more people and take advantage of more platforms, we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel. We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership. Amen. How are you doing, Nottingham? How are you doing? Wonderful, wonderful. I haven't preached here in a while. Um, Five weeks ago, I took myself, my family, and uh, we just, like Abraham, went down to London um, to plant a missions base, which some of you have been to see. Um, it's been an interesting journey. It's been, it's, it's been doing this all over again. This is the third time I've done this in five years, and it doesn't get any more predictable. Um, but you guys have been in my heart. You've been in my mind. I know there's a whole lot of you who are not here over this summer period. But for those of you who are here, give your neighbor a high five and say, I don't know, say something. Just say something. Say something. Say anything. Anything. Say, 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 yeah. amen. say amen. Yes, amen. Amen, yes, amen, amen, amen works for me, amen works for me, okay, um, right, so I must warn you, this is going to be a, a, a quick strike hit, um, we, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you uh, don't happen to have been aware, we are, every first weekend of the month, in Ecclesia Kingdom Movement, we have something called the Threshing Floor Weekend, on the Friday we have something called Threshing Floor, which is a revival watch night where we come, we pray, we worship first of all till we can worship no more. Then we pray till we can pray no more. Amen. Then we hear a word from God and we pray some more. Uh, and it's a time of personal consecration and revival. And um, some time, most times as well, the time of intercession for ourselves. Our, this is the order I like to stress. Yourself. Someone say myself. Because you can't effect a change that hasn't been effected in you. Are you with me? Uh, the... Uh, I, I must have said a bunch, a thousand things over the course of my life. But the one favorite quote I remember from 10 or so years ago that the Lord gave me was, the kingdom of God can only come through you to the extent it has come in you. Amen? Amen. I repeat that. The kingdom of God can only come through you. Say it can only come through me to the extent it has come in me. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a culture where they say, my mother's language, there's a fire. You first put off the fire on yourself before you try to put it off on your child. Now, that sounds very unloving, doesn't it? But if you are burning and you're trying to put out a fire on a baby, what's going to happen? So the first person, and the Bible says, love the Lord your God, first instruction. With all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, great. What's the next instruction? Love your neighbor as your... Just toss it, just toss it, it's all right. They don't mind, do you? Good. Love your neighbor as your... As your what? Come on, talk back to me. I, yeah, it's, as your what? As yourself. The, the reason why some of us have a problem loving people is we really don't love ourselves. Honestly, we, we don't. And, and you can tell whether or not you love yourself based on the words that come out of your mouth sometimes. Based on the thoughts you think, oh, stupid me, there I go again. You know, nothing, oh, I never do anything right. You know, I see some people go, uh, duh, John, you're so stupid. I'm like, who's John? Me. I'm like, Really? So we pray for ourselves, not selfishly, but so we can be aligned with God's will. Then we pray for our families. Amen. Are you with me? Then we pray for our churches because church of churches are built on families and people groups. Then we pray for our cities uh, because in the words of William McDowell, God doesn't see a city with a church in it. He sees a church with a city around it. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, to the church at, to the church at, to the church at, to the church at. He doesn't write to the city. He writes to the church. Amen. Then we pray for our nations. So that was Friday. Uh, This Saturday, normally we don't have anything on the Saturday, but this Saturday we gathered our workers, those of us who are still around who haven't disappeared, uh, and uh, our guest minister spoke to us and encouraged us from 30 years worth of ministry. Who was blessed yesterday? And once I put the mic down, literally, you might, it might look like an SSS, Sacred Service Operation. But once I put the mic down, I am bolting out of the door and I'm driving three and a half or three hours to London where we're going to have a night of breakthrough, which you're all invited to. Amen? 
Amen. It's the last leg of Threshing Floor Weekend. Usually we have everything in the same city, but this month we've broken it down. So Reverend Iang is going to be with us in London this evening. And at a breakthrough is simply a forum where God can just show up and break through in every area of our lives. Friday is for him. Sunday is for us. Amen. Shall I repeat that? Friday is to meet the needs of his heart. Sunday is to meet the needs of our heart. And he has promised to heal, to deliver, to save, to give prophetic instruction, prophetic direction, prophetic release. And I am looking forward to this evening. Is anybody else joining me looking forward to this evening? So look at your neighbor and say, if you weren't going to be there, change your mind. All right, this morning, I want to just, like I said, shoot quickly. It's going to be a drive-by. I'm going to just shoot as I'm driving by, amen. And whatever I hit, I hit. Whatever I miss, Pastor Shepherds will clear up in my absence. Get your Bible out with me this morning. You want to stand with me and lift it up real quick? Come on, stand. Let's do this. Say, this is my Bible. You don't sound convinced. Did you steal it? Okay, then say it loud and proud. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I am what it says I am. I will do what it says I should do. Today I will hear God's word. It will build me up and give me my inheritance among the saints. My life will never be the same again. Amen. All right. While you got that Bible out, open it to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, Proverbs, Proverbs. Chapter 12, I believe it is. Verse 14. This is where we're going to just take off from. Like It's not going to be a mess. It's going to be a drive-by. All right. If I want you to read together with me in unison. Have we got a version on the... Okay. Proverbs 12, I said, verse 14. You know what? Let's not wait for them. Also, whatever version you've got, just read it. It'll sound like a wonderful harmony. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Good. Proverbs 12, chapter 14. One, two, go. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. One more time. A man shall be satisfied with with good by the fruit of his mouth and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him now turn with me to the book of james very quickly and then i'll let you sit down after this one book of james chapter three from verse three james chapter three verse three We're going to read three and four. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Verse five. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you, Michael. Hallelujah. For the sake of a title, Chrissy, so you don't come and meet me after the service and ask me what the title is. I don't know. Let me think of a title on the fly. I want to I talk this morning about creating your world. Somebody say creating your world. Say creating your world. Um, and let, let me break my modus operandi a little bit and, and, and do an introduction. I want to just give you a rough idea of what I want to address today. Um, now, th- there is a dichotomy that exists in... In the church, uh, Satan has done well over the last 25 or 30 years or so to create two camps. They're the, camps of those, or the camp of those who believe that God is a sugar daddy. All he's interested in is blessing me, right? Uh, we, we give it names like the prosperity message, the faith message. It's all about me. Someone look at your neighbor and say, it's all about me. Neighbor, tell them, no, it ain't. 
Okay. As far as this camp is concerned, Christianity is about growing into a place where you can exercise your faith to literally manipulate God to do stuff for you. So you are taught, and nothing wrong with it, but it's almost like the sign of your maturity is how much of God's ability you can bring to bear in your personal life. Uh, like Kenneth Copeland once said, me, my wife, my son, John, and his wife, us four, and no more. And then we have the other camp who believe that Christianity is all about picking up a cross, following God, and doing stuff for his glory at the expense of your personal needs and circumstances. And so they believe that your maturity as a Christian is based on how many orphans you pray for every day and how many sufferings you have been through without backsliding. Are you listening to me? And, and, and they believe that, you know, God doesn't really care about the things that concern your life. And he just wants you to serve him. Someone say serve him. Serve him. You know, and, and, and if you go to a church where, where you have a leadership that is very, very focused on the will of God, we can almost give you the impression, just suck it up and bear it. And, you know, just come to church and serve God and evangelize and pray and, and reach out and, you know, and, and, and yeah, whatever happens to you happens. Who's ever felt that way before? Now, the Bible tells in the book of Peter chapter, First, no, Second Peter chapter 1, that God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. Someone say life and godliness. What this means is God does not have to choose between the affairs of my life and the affairs of my godliness. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay, you know I like to be answered. There is nothing less spiritual about exercising your faith for the affairs of your life as there is about exercising it for the affairs of others. Are you listening to me? But the Bible says, love your neighbor as. So we come to the issue of balance. Someone say balance. Now, I want to I've come to realize this. Let me just put this out there very quickly that. I don't know about you. Now, I've heard people say, oh, you know, when, I, when things are going wrong with me, I'm very spiritual. I don't find that to be the case. If that's you, that's great for you. But I've heard people say, you know, when you're going through stuff and, you know, you're suffering and you're poor and you're this and that, then, then you're spiritual. Have you, have you anybody ever heard that before? Then, then, you know, you really, then, you know, God can. No, nah, I don't know about that. That's not me. I'm at my most spiritual when I'm okay. I'm just being real. When, 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 when my life is reasonably in order, then I remember I need to pray for A and B and C and D. Amen. Then I pray for the widows and the orphans and for Israel and, and Hamas. And I mean, that kind of stuff comes naturally to me when my life is going as it should. But, but when things are upside down, I don't get spiritual. I get grumpy. Are you listening to me? I've also discovered that a life where you are constantly exposed to the power of God at work has a way of affecting your personal consecration. For instance, when you go to church and you have a service where God is healing and delivering and miracles are breaking out and all that kind of glorious stuff, I usually find it easy to wake up in the, the next morning and pray. Is it just me? When I'm exposed to the good, if the Bible says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance, I have discovered that the greatness of God in my life and in the lives of those around me is usually commensurate to how much faith and how much zeal and zest I have to push on with his agenda in my life. Am I the only one who feels that way? So I hear people say, oh, you know, when things are going wrong and I'm sick and I'm sick and I'm suffering, then I get more spiritual. It doesn't apply to me. Anybody else like that? If it does, more power to you. Come and lay hands after, on me after the service. But it doesn't apply to me. Good morning, sir. Good to have you. So that there comes this balance we have to strike between establishing the will of God around us and the will of God being established in us. Does that make sense? Like I said, the will of God or the kingdom of God can only be established through you to the extent it is established in you. Now, in the Old Testament, the manifestation of the will of God was the Mosaic law. In the New Testament, it's the message of grace and the writing of the nature of God in the heart of the believer. Now, what was to the old applies to the new. Amen? The old was a shadow of the new. In the old, we are told that if you offend or break one aspect of the law, you've broken it all. 
Does that make sense? So if you don't steal, you don't cheat, you don't fornicate, but you, you, know, you, don't, you wear something with both cotton and polyester in it, as far as the kingdom is concerned, you've failed in everything. Now, a similar prophetic type applies in the new. What it means is this. The righteousness of God, the Bible tells in Romans chapter 1, being revealed from faith to faith. The word righteousness means that good and perfect thing that conforms to the revealed will of God. Somebody say the revealed will of God. Is it God's will for you to live above sin? Yes. Is it God's will for you not to fornicate? Yes. Is it God's will for you to pray and read your Bible? Yes. But the Bible says, is it God's will for you to be thankful in all things? Does the Bible say it is God's will for you to prosper and be in health? It's all part of the will. Are you with me? So the same way if you break one side of the old law, you've broken everything. In the New Testament, if one part of the righteousness of God is missing in your life. Now, I'm not saying you get punished, but God is not glorified if your life is out of balance. If you're a prayer warrior who can't pay your bills, or you're the biggest tither in the church who can keep your zippers up, are you with me? There has to come a balance where the righteousness of God is revealed in every aspect of your life. Like he said, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Are you listening to me? Someone say life. Life and godliness. You know, like, like I heard Reverend Yang say on Friday, a godly man is the one whose family looks, looks okay. Does that make sense? His children are looked after. I know many children who grew up in church who want to have nothing to do with church. Because their identity of Christianity is a life of sorrow, pain. And it stole their parents from them. Mommy was praying while the child was starving. Are you listening to me? Daddy said, son, it's God's will that we get kicked out of our house. The house was repossessed and the father said, son, God allowed this to happen. And a 10-year-old told him, so whatever God allows my house to be repossessed and makes me have to go into the social security security system and get abused and mistreated, whatever that kind of God is, I don't want to have anything to do with him. So someone say balance. Balance. The righteousness of God must be revealed in balance. Amen. Now, part of this righteousness is what I want to talk to you about today. Now, you can go back to God and say, God, pastor said this morning, you know, the righteousness of God should be revealed in in the other areas of my life. And so I demand to see this work and that work. And you can pray till the cows come home and not see results. Because the other side to this is part of the righteousness or the revealed will of God is that his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so far are his ways and thoughts above ours. The Bible says, meaning if I will download the will of God, if I will download the righteousness of God, I must play by the rules of God. Who knows what I'm talking about? There is a pattern God has laid for every aspect of my life. I must discover it. And apply it. If I, if, I, if, I, if I start on this path and I start walking, where am I going to end up? In a straight line. Where am I going to end up? I'm going to hit what? It's made of aluminium. What do you think is going to happen if I run into it? I'm going to hurt myself, right? Can any amount of prayer and fasting stop this collision? Shata, laba, si riata. Father, I bind every metal in my way. What, 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 what would you say to me if I was doing that? You know, like we heard yesterday, does your elevator go all the way up? Amen. Because there is action and consequence. There is, there is you know, there is act, action and effect. And the same thing applies in the spirit. God painstakingly over 4,000 years laid down a blueprint called the Bible for every aspect of life. And told us that it was his honor as a king to withhold in that book, but it was our exo- or his honor as God, but our honor to be kings, to search it out. And so we can cry and scream and wail if we don't discover and apply his principles in every area of life, we will find ourselves on the outside looking in. Are you listening to me? Years ago, I discovered the blueprint for living a life of sinlessness. It wasn't condemning myself. It wasn't fasting and praying. It was taken by faith that the righteousness of God was revealed in me. As simple as that sounds. You know, I was, I was crying to God as usual. What we do when we've messed up. And Lord, just kill me next time I do it. And God said, son, you said that three or four times already. You should be dead four times over. You know, Lord, shut up, mama. You know, every yoke of sin in my life. And, and I just realized that the more I focused on sin, the bigger it became. 
It's simple. The, the more my prayer time was focused on my flaws, the more magnified they became. And one day while I was preaching, no less, I was actually a preacher at this time, the Lord said to me, son, you're dead to sin. And I said, no, I don't. I feel very alive. He says, I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, you're dead. And for the next two or three or four weeks, I began to chew and I didn't understand grace at the point. I hadn't studied the, co- the concept of grace. All I knew was I was hearing an instruction. And as I began to decree and meditate on the fact that I was dead to sin, and I began to focus on the goodness and the beauty of God and no longer condemning myself. Now, I'm not saying I wasn't sorry when I messed up. It wasn't licensed to continue practicing sin. But rather than stabbing myself in my flesh, I began to reach out to God and say, your mercies endure forever. Your goodness will lead me to repentance. And the more I focused on him, the more of a displacement occurred. And I woke up one day, a few months later, wow, I haven't done this for a while. Are you with me? Now, the same thing applies to the issues of our lives. God has designed a system to allow you to create your world. The book of Hebrews tells us that we know. Someone say, we know. know. Now, they knew, but we don't in the body of Christ today. Paul told the guys then, we know that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Somebody say framed. Framed. The worlds were framed by the word of God. That the things that appear were made by things which do not appear. Now, the word worlds there means the time frame. Someone say time frames. The Greek is the word alon or ion, the time frames, the dispensation. Somebody say dispensations. The dispensations were framed. Someone say framed by the word of God. What this means is both for the universe as a whole, but also for my life and yours, every season should be framed. Now, a frame can be a boundary or a skeletal structure. Amen. A frame can set boundaries, right? And it can be a skeletal structure. Are you listening to me? The Bible says, Kofo, that your worlds, meaning the seasons of your life, or at least his worlds anyway, the seasons of God's times, were framed, meaning the boundaries were set and the structure was set by the word of God. That the things which appear now came from things we can't see. Romans 12 tells us that we should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service. Meaning you don't need to be clapped for to live right. You know, uh, I've told you guys the story before. When I was a teenager and I was about 21 or so, I went to my dad and I said, you know, you should be very proud to have a son like me. Because he was having a go at me about something. I said, I haven't gotten anybody pregnant. You know, where I come from, children sell their parents' property. Literally. You see a house, say this house on the, on the wall, this house is not for sale. Don't mind Dilly. You know, I said, I haven't sold your house behind you. I haven't sold your generator. You know, I don't steal your car. I don't do drugs. I've never been called to the police station. And I was waiting for an applause. And he said, you're a stupid boy. I said, why? He says, you want an award for that? Someone say reasonable service. But why should you present your body as a living sacrifice? Holiness is not an end in itself. Are you with me? The same way sin was not an end in itself. The issue on Calvary wasn't just sin in that we messed up. It was that our messing up violated the principles of God and we fell short of his glory. So for us to reconnect with that level of living and existence and thinking, the sin issue had to be sorted out. He then says, be not conformed to this world to this dispensation, to this way of doing things, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look at the process. Live right so that you can experience a transformation by your mind being renewed by that book so that you can prove. The word prove means demonstrate or authenticate the good, perfect, and it's one will. It's not three like we were taught in Sunday school. God doesn't have a good will, then well, there's an, no, 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 it's one will, it's good, it's perfect, it's acceptable. In essence, when I renew my mind, when I live according to his laws and his principles, amen, then my life can become an expression amen. of his will. Right. Meaning he can then use me to demonstrate to the world that what he promised does happen. Yes. Does that make sense? 
But there is a price I must pay. I must first of all make sure I am not conformed to the world. And it doesn't just matter or it doesn't just apply to what we call sin. Are you with me? This is not just in areas of fornication and adultery and lying. It applies to every aspect of our life. So like we read in Proverbs 12, let's go back there very quickly. Now that we've established that, let's do the flyby and let's, let's run. Amen. Proverbs 12, let's go back there. From verse 14, yes. Proverbs 12, verse 14. Let me show you one of the instructions or one of the principles that many believers don't understand and don't follow through with. And I must confess, there are times in my life where God has to slap me in the backside of my head and remind me of this stuff. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's heart or hands shall be rendered unto him. A man shall be satisfied, finish that with me, by what? By the, start again, a man shall be, by the good of the fruit of his mouth. Pause. The Bible says, death and life are the power of the tongue. And those that love it will eat the fruit thereof. A man shall not be satisfied with just the good of his thoughts. A man shall not be satisfied with just the good of the promises of God. Hello. Um, Unless you subscribe to an evil power, and eventually that power will, will come back to bite you in the backside. A man shall not just be satisfied by the good of the works of his hands. A man shall be satisfied by what? The good of the fruit. What's a fruit? To develop seed. Right? A seed that has partnered with its environment to change and produce a desired result. Right? So you put the seed in the ground, the elements and the nutrients partner with the component of the seed to extract the DNA of the seed to produce the harvest. Peter says we're not born again by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible seed, even the word of God. So the word of God is a seed. Are you with me? Or should I say is the seed? We compare scripture with scripture. The Bible says that you shall be satisfied by the good of the fruit of your lips. What it means is there must be seeds coming forth from your lips, which will partner with your environment To produce a result. Are you listening to me? The seed does not need to know that it has the potential to be a tree in it. There are things in the environment, nutrients and elements designed to tap into the potential of that seed and bring forth a tree. But this is the problem. This is what most Christians do. I don't know why things are just going wrong. Eh, Only me. Nobody likes me. Because I'm black. Because I'm white. You know, it's amazing how racism is, is going the other way. If you don't believe me, trust me, I do know. You know, the same way sexism is going the other way now. We, we, we're now trying to protect the victim so much that now a, 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 a Caucasian person can open their mouth and just pass a... Uh, who knows what I'm talking about? People are losing their jobs for just saying things that I don't find offensive. Amen. But, but when you begin to come... And, and this is how most Christians' prayers go. We spend one hour telling God every single thing that is wrong. God, are you aware my rent is due? And my wife is crazy. And my husband needs to be hit. And, you know, and, and when we spend an hour complaining and rehearsing every single thing that is wrong. Then we say, well, Lord, so help me. In Jesus' name I pray. What seeds have we sown? So the Bible says we must come into his presence with thanksgiving in our heart. Because the presence of God will multiply what you say. And if you come in with grumbling and complaining, you'll get. Like I told the Israelites, what you said in my ears, I'll give to you. Especially in the UK, we ask people, how are you doing? Ah, I'm just managing. Actually, no, that's, that's, that's even where I come from in Nigeria. Uh, in the UK, we say things like, man, it's tough. You know, how are you doing? Ah, you know. Just sowing negative seeds. And so we are being satisfied by the bad of the fruit of our lips. 
Now you look at the second part. He says, and shall be rewarded by the work of his hands. Now this is, this is the dichotomy now. God spent one entire chapter speaking in Genesis 1. He spent seven days talking. So much he had to rest. Hello. The Bible talks about all things being held by the word of his power. And words take power. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you are spirit and life. For those of you who talk too much, you need to. Amen. Because words release energy. They take something from you. Uh, it's been proved that one hour of preaching is equivalent to seven hours of hard labor. Because if you're speaking under the anointing, it drains you. Amen. Are you listening to me? That's why preachers need encouragement. Aha, aha. Okay, now, but hear me. God spent six days talking and said he rested from his work, the Bible says. Then we look at the next chapter in chapter 2, and it says he then stooped down, humbled himself. Amen. Amen. Got his hands dirty and fashioned what he spoke. It happened for man. It happened for the creatures of the earth. There's a pattern here. Nothing is licensed to be created in the earth realm or fashioned that has not been released by words from the spirit realm. Amen. Amen. At the point it is spoken in faith, it exists. There must then be corresponding action to build what has been created. Are you listening to me? Now, if you attempt to build it before speaking it, you'll be frustrated. If all you do is speak it and don't build it, you'll be frustrated. And that takes humility. God spoke from heaven. Lord have mercy. Then came down to the earth to fashion. Are you listening? Now, we speak from the problem and we try and fashion from the spirit realm. So, we talk our experience. Are you listening to me? We talk our experience and then we now go in prayer and try and solve it. Father, Lord, let my car come. Let my wife. No, no, it doesn't work that way, honey. You must first talk from the level of the solution. Are you listening to me? You speak at the frequency of the solution. And when you are done broadcasting successfully, then you come down to the earth and you begin to get your hands dirty according to the pattern of what you spoke from the heavens. Are you listening to me? So in your prayer time, you allow the word of God dwell richly in your heart by faith. You let the picture of God come alive in prayer. God shows you your future, shows you your destiny, shows you his purpose for you and you begin to proclaim it. I am walking in my best days. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. You begin to speak. I am a godly wife. I'm a wonderful father. You declare it from his level, from his level, sorry, from his frequency. Then you come down out of your prayer closet. You then say, okay, what I've just spoken, what do I now need to do on the earth? Are you listening to me? That's how you create your world. Something is creating your world. I, I got to tell you this. Something is creating your world. Whatever you are seeing and speaking is creating your world. If you don't do it actively, something will do it for you. The media will do it for you, amen. Your friends will do it for you, your family, your culture. If you don't see, you are the sum total today of all you saw and thought in the past. All you saw, thought and spoke in the past. Amen. Nobody else is to blame for where your life is right now. That's right. You know, and I told you guys this before. You don't think I'm be- I told you I was abused as a child sexually, amen. So, I mean, I, I grew up in a one-parent household, amen. So, I mean, I- I- so, I'm not being unfair, I'm not being unloving. No, I'm just telling you the truth. Amen. It is no one's fault you are where you are. The one thing no human being can lose is the right to respond. You can decide what happens to you, but you can decide how you respond. And God has given us the spirit of faith as the great equation leveler. It doesn't matter where you started from or where I started from. The spirit of faith is the one thing that God gives all human beings. Both saved and unsaved. Are you listening to me? It's the great balancing agent. 
Job is complaining to God and saying, why is all this happening to me? Now, the Bible tells us exactly why it was happening. Satan went to God and said, give me a chance to show this guy. And God says, go ahead. So God could have said, well, you know, this is happening to you because I've given Satan a chance to blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't the answer God gave him. God asked him a question. God said, since your days began, have you commanded the morning? So I know Satan is after you. I know the, the demon in your mother's village is calling out your name. Talk to me some more. Amen. I, I know everything is against you. I know your boss is racist. But as far as God's concerned, Job was where he was at that time. Not because Satan was given a license to attack him. But because he had not responded appropriately to the license. When, I mean, the Bible says the sons of God were gathering are you a son of God? Are you a son of God? Does the Bible say in the New Testament, we are the sons of God? Beloved, now we are the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear where we shall be, but we know this when he comes, we will be like him because we will see him clearly through his word and in our prayer lives as he is. Are you a son of God? So the Bible says that Satan took permission at a meeting of the sons of God by speaking. Where were you at the meeting? When the meetings are being called to determine the affairs of your life, are you present or absent? Talk to me. And even if you miss the meeting where it's been discussed, I mean, many times in prayer, prophetically, God has opened my eyes to see what Satan is planning. For those of us who think we're not that prophetic, the dream world is the one great balancer. God gives dreams to everybody. So you can't say, no one here can say God doesn't talk to you because at least you can dream. And the things you see in your dream world are not just... The, you know, uh, the movie you watched in the cinema, you watched the horror movie, then something is chasing you. Okay, yes. Now, no, it works that way sometimes, but not all the time. Yes, there are invitations for you to step up to the plate when you wake up. Amen. Amen. You have watched a scene where an accuser has presented their case in a courtroom of heaven. Then the accuser sits down and the judge says, does the defense have anything to say? And this is what many of us say. And God says, okay, enter that in the defense. Are you listening to me? It doesn't matter what the stock market is saying. Doesn't matter what the immigration rules are saying. Doesn't matter what, what society is saying. Doesn't matter what your bank account is saying. We pray this almost every single threshing floor, right? The book of John says everything. I mean, come on. There's three, there are three that bear witness. The Bible says on the earth. Not the stock market. Hear me? Not the educational system. Not your bank account. What are the three that bear witness on the earth? The water, the spirit, and the blood. Are you listening to me? So any other witness is irrelevant. If it does not agree with the water of your sanctification... The spirit, which is the earnest of your inheritance, which is God's deposit, that he will finish what he started. Yes, and the blood that speaks better things over your life than the blood of Abel, if it contradicts these witnesses, it should be thrown out of the court. Amen. The problem is there's a fourth witness, you. And when you show up in that courtroom in the spirit, you can violate everything else they say. And what you say goes. Amen. You shall have what you say. Amen. Simple. Are you listening to me? There's three, the judge in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Doesn't matter what spirit is in the atmosphere. Second, third, fourth, fifteenth. And trust me, I am not on, you, you know me. I am not on a of spiritual warfare. Amen. Uh, like Paul says, I cast out demons more than you all. I'm very aware of how these things work. I come from the capital of witchcraft in Africa. Amen. My doorstep is where they do their stuff, where they have their, 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 their international gatherings of witches. Amen. Are you listening to me? Uh, it's normal to walk past the streets of where, I, where, where my father comes from. And I told you, see two 10-year-old boys fighting. One takes off the shirt and throws and it hangs. So I, I'm, I'm aware of the devil's purposes and plans. Amen. But I'm also aware that whatever I do not give license to with my mouth is illegal in the atmosphere of my life. I am the commander of the ship of my life under the influence of God by this thing called my tongue. Amen. Amen. Under the influence. 
under the influence. And it's okay to drive under this influence. If I, I love driving long distances these days. Because all the ministry, family, business. When I'm in a car for three hours, I've got time. Rebo, Santa, La Bahia. I can begin to think clearly. Oh, cool. I, I begin to realize this pattern and that. Oh, that's going on. And, and have you noticed how this is? And I begin to speak. And if you see me, if, I, if the police stop me when I'm driving, sometimes they'll think I'm crazy. Like, Shata, Namakuta, La Bahia. And I begin to declare. And I begin to speak. Someone say Speak. Speak. Speak, speak, speak. The Bible says God speaks the things that are not as though they are. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what differentiates you and God. You're in his image, you're in his likeness. Are you listening to me? If he's a big MacBook or big Mac tower, your small laptop, amen. His processor is much greater than yours. His hard drive is much greater than yours. But you have the same operating system. Meaning the same audio files that work on his system will work on yours. His word in your mouth is just as potent as his word in his mouth. But it has to be in your mouth. Joshua 1.8, for you to have good success, it's not enough to meditate. Amen. Amen. It's not enough to study the book of the law. It says it should not depart from your mouth. Someone say mouth. mouth. Not ears. Mouth. Not mind, but mouth. mouth. Too many silent witnesses in the body of Christ. I mean, imagine we called to a courtroom and, and the accuser has just blasted you. Just literally, just, 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 just completely annihilated you and called you all sorts of names and, and told the judge how they did this and they found a murder weapon and they just laid their case. And then you get there, say, 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 so Mr. Defendant, what do you have to say to these things? Well, judge, you know, I'm just going to leave it to you to decide. You know, I'm sure if you look at me, you can tell that I'm a good guy. Right? Say, George, well, you know, I'm a good guy. I'm sure you can tell that I'm not the kind of guy that's likely to have done that kind of stuff. So, so I'm just going to leave it to your judgment. Thank you, sir. I'm just going to leave it to your judgment to figure out whether or not you think I'm guilty. How will that fly? How will that fly? It won't. No matter how good you are, even if the judge can tell you're innocent, he's not allowed to rule by what he can discern. He's only allowed to rule by the facts of the case, by the constitution of the kingdom he's working in, and by the testimony of you or your defendant lawyer. Listen, three things he's allowed to rule by, by the facts of the case. Right? So the facts already are against you. The facts say... You've been fired from your job. The facts say everybody you date dumps you at the altar. That's what the facts say. So if you leave it to the facts, he'll rule against you. Secondly, he's allowed to rule by the constitution of the country he serves. Are you listening to me? So that's, that's one one now. It's balanced now. The facts are against you, but the constitution is in your favor. It says you're the head, not the tail, the first, not the last, above, not beneath, amen. It says you will not die, but come on, so the constitution is in your favor. So it's one, one, heading into extra time. The tiebreaker will be your testimony. If you're, oh, come on. And, And the Bible says we have an accuser of the brethren. See, if Satan was not allowed to accuse you, he would not be welcome in heaven. But the Bible says he accuses you day and night. And God doesn't kick him out. Because it is legal for him to accuse you. It is legal. It's perfectly legal. For the enemy to wake up. I mean, see, witchcraft doesn't see. You know those, pot- those potions you see in films? They're just to help the faith of the witch. The same way some of the things we do in the body of Christ, the gymnastics we do, are just to help the faith of the minister and the person being ministered to. It's not about to, you know, I mean, God knows some of us have to, to believe so. He will give us, you know. But it's not about all that nonsense, you know. You know, go, get, go bring a bottle of oil. That's, it's a point of contact. It's godly but it's to help your faith. The critical piece are the words coming out of your mouth. That's how witchcraft works. They begin to speak curses over you. And those curses begin to give a false appearance. Things begin to look a certain way. And the minute you verbally agree with your atmosphere, it becomes legal. 
It's the same thing in the kingdom. Call me a godly witch if you may. All I'm allowed to do as a preacher, as a pastor, is to speak blessing over you. And when you are in an anointed service or you are in an anointed counseling session and a man or woman is speaking on the influence of God, you begin to feel good, don't you? So you it's almost like with the witch. Something positive begins to come and shift into your atmosphere. You can almost reach out and taste it, but it will not work if you do not agree with it with your lips. Amen. And so you can leave the most anointed service feeling the greatest anointing, feeling wonderful. Go home, sleep, wake up the next day and you're right back where you were. Are you listening to me? Final scripture as I drop this mic. Like I told you, we're going to shoot out of here in a few seconds. James chapter 3, we looked at it. Now the Bible says, behold, we have great ships that are turned with such a small helm wherever the captain wants them to go. It then says, we have horses and we put bits in their mouth. Now, for some of us, we've never tried this whole speaking nonsense. But for some of us, this is the problem. It hasn't worked before. Right? True? I said, well, pastor, I spoke and I declared and I hollered and I screamed and I spun around and nothing happened. Thank you, Michael. This is how it works. The Bible here is, 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 con- is what's the word now? Comparing the operations of a ship on a sea with a horse, with a rider. It's talking about the tongue as we read. What it means is there are some circumstances or situations that are horse-like and there are some that are ship-like. If you are galloping on a horse, if you yank, the, or the, 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 what's the word now, the saddle or what's it called now, any horse riders here, the reins, thank you. You yank the reins, immediately the horse will turn on a dime, right, right? But it's only so far a horse, a horse, even horses get tired. It's only so fast it can run, only so far it can run. Amen. Amen. There are some things in your life and there, are, there is a level of faith you get to where the time between speaking and seeing, for instance, God, it took God one chapter between what he spoke and what he saw. Hello. I got one chapter. There are times where the time between speaking and seeing is almost instantaneous. But there are times where it's longer. You know why it's longer? Because those times are like a ship on the sea of the spirit. It's massive. And this usually comes to play with destiny now. It's massive. It's big. And when you start turning that little dial... It looks like nothing's happening. Amen. It looks like nothing's happening. The ship begins to move ever so. I mean, you need to start turning hours in advance if you want to take a 90 degree turn. And I mean, and because are you aware the earth is spinning right now? Yes. Or are you aware? I know you know, but are you conscious of the fact that it's spinning? No, you know why? Because it's so big. But it's turning at a speed that would kill you if you were aware with fright. But because of the environment, it's not noticeable to you. So you think it's stable. But it's moving in two different dimensions. It's spinning on an axis. And it's also spinning round an orbit. But because of its size and its gravity, we think we're sat down. The same way when a huge ship like the Titanic is turning, at first it looks like nothing is happening. And this is what many of us do. We speak, 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 speak. We get frustrated, then we turn back. Two days of I'm the blessed and not the cursed. And then one week of, ah, death, this death will kill me. One day of by his stripes I am healed. Seven days of, Lord, am I going to die of this disease? And so we turn, and we turn back. And then we turn. And so God's confused. The spirit realm is confused. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, that, it's double-minded. That, that's one of the expressions of being double minded the bible says let that man not think he can receive anything from god not because god doesn't want to give him anything but he is violating the principles of god and god's hands are tied behind his back which is where faith comes in it's a substance now not tomorrow 
Now faith is the substance of what I am hoping for. So faith must be more than hope. It's not enough just to hope. Too many Christians have too much hope and, no, and too little faith. Faith is tangible reality, substance in my spirit of what I am hoping for. It is a substantiation of a desired future. It means that I know. Let me give you an example very simply. If I hand you, who's, the, who's got my car keys? Who got my car keys? Okay. If I say, Pastor Sam, I, but I haven't. Don't, 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 don't jump and don't hug me. But if I say, Pastor Sam, I have a new car for you. Okay, if I say, Pastor Sam, I have a new car for you, what goes through your mind? You're happy. Why are you happy? You heard something. But what if I'm a liar? What if I can, okay, what if Pastor Shepard said to me and said, don't mind him. That's how he promised me a car five years ago. And I'm still waiting for it. What will happen immediately to that, your happiness? To die down. So what, what changed? Yeah, what you heard changed. But what did what you hear change? Yes, but there's a core. What, 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 what made the expectation change? Your perception of the promiser, right? So you heard something that shaped wrongly your perception of me. So you went from elation to doubt. That's what happens in life on a daily basis. So that proves to me that all you had was hope. Because only hope can be affected by perception now if i then gave you this key and he said the same thing to you what would you say to him why because you have substance you haven't seen the car right you haven't seen the car yet or i could give you the log book that's another form of faith or the deeds to a house you haven't seen it you're st- you don't know what it looks like. It could be a banger. It could be a non-starter, right? It could, but you know there's now something that you are hoping. So you, you have the substance of what you're hoping for. That's the first part of faith. The second part is this. Please stand with me, Pastor Sam. No, stand with me. Stand with me. So if I say, if I give, the, if I give you the key, say, bless you. Um, now, let's assume that was a Bentley. It's not. Well, let's assume it was a Bentley. What would you then do straight away? Would you wait around to say hello to everybody no. else? You know, would you? No, no, no. What would you do? Just go. Right. Where's the car park? What direction is the car park? What direction is the car park? That way, okay. Start going. Stop. What has he just done? Evidence. So faith is the substance of what he can see and the evidence, or what he's hoping for, sorry, and the evidence. Now, this evidence starts with speaking are you with me are you with me faith without works is dead being alone faith starts with receiving the word of god it comes by hearing in a tangible way that becomes uncontestable so you know it's done you're not thinking you're not hoping and like i tell people pray until the point of faith if it takes you one week until you feel it keep praying at the point at which you feel it or not feel is the wrong word but in which you discern receiving it stop asking and start demonstrating oh, yes. thank you go you can sit down a friend of mine was told by the doctors i mean you, you've heard my story and my wife but i'll tell you his because you're sick and tired of hearing mine was told by his doctors tubes are out Fallopian tubes removed. Brochure for adoption. They gave them a pamphlet saying, this is how to adopt a child because you're never going to have one. And I were praying and I called him and I said, the Lord showed me that about this time next year, you had a child. And he believed. So the first thing he did was he went to buy a chair a nursing chair he bought a cot bought baby things I listen to me bought feeding bottles bought everything the wife says you're crazy he says no I heard something and then every morning he began to speak to an unconceived child he began to call the child forth 
called the child's gender, called the child's destiny, began to call the child by name. Are you listening to me? They just began to speak. So they would have their morning devotion and he would pray and then talk to an invisible member of the family. Are you listening to me? That child is 36 weeks old now in the womb and about to be delivered. The doctor said, what did you do? Now, if there were tubes, they could have done IVF. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I want to say frame. Frame. What we do is we look at the prevailing circumstances and like Pastor Shepherds, it talks us out of confidence mm. in the one whose promise we are holding on to. But the, the, and I end with this, the proof of true faith, the Bible says we haven't believed, have spoken. You cannot have, you cannot claim to have faith for something you are not ready to talk about. Yeah. For many of us, the missing piece in this issue is God is waiting for us to talk. So stand with me this afternoon. I want to give you a chance to talk. I don't know what you need to talk about. Come on now. I don't know what the issues are. How about that? Come on now. Come on, come on, come on. But I want to give you a chance to talk. You've been too silent. You've been a silent witness for too long. Now, I didn't say pray. I'm not asking you to direct this at God. I want you to talk to the circumstance. Talk to the situation. Talk to the barrenness. Talk to the joblessness. Talk to the sinful addiction. Talk to the unloved family member. Come on now. Talk to the legal situation. And if you can find the word of God that applies to it, then put that word in your mouth and speak to it. Come on, come on, open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and speak. I am the head, not the tail. I'm the first, not the last. My life is a monument of praise to the faithfulness of God. Whatever my hands touch, prosper. My family prospers. My children prosper. My wife prospers. The house of God he has put me over to govern prospers. My business prospers. Come on somebody. Doors are opening for me. The two leaf gates are being opened. In the name of Jesus. The wealth of the Gentiles is laid up for me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Sin has no power over me. I will not die but live to declare the works of the Lord. My wife and my children will be gathered around my table like fruitful plants. And the Romo, I am a tree planted by the rivers of waters. My fruit will come forth in my season. Libre inna elelo This house of the Lord will be exalted above the mountain of the Lord and all the nations of the earth will flow in. This will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Libre keep come on now. He that blesses me is blessed. He that tries to curse me is already cursed. The hand of the Lord is mighty upon my life. The Eel Shenemana, thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. You are the glory and the lifter of my head. There is no divination against Jacob, there is no enchantment against Israel. Ibre Una, many of those that rise up against me, they have come one way, but they will flee seven different ways. The Spirit of God inside of me is raising up a standard against the enemy. Come on, declare, declare, declare. Declare concerning your health. Declare concerning your marriage. Declare concerning your ministry, your business, your destiny, your calling. Take no thought for the prevailing circumstances. The enemy has already spoken his side of the story. But you have the the opportunity to enter the courtroom of heaven this morning and to present your case. Present your case. Come on, present your case. Lembre in an ul el en an al el ul al ibra usha talabahaya. 
Father, your word says that the kingdom starts as small as a seed and it grows to become a mighty tree and all the birds of the area nestle therein. Father, I speak a fatherly blessing upon this house this morning. When you turn Jerusalem upside down, it was with a mere fraction of the people in this room right now. Twelve men caused a revolution that the world has not recovered from. I speak to everyone present and those that are away. And I speak the blessing of the Lord upon this house. I speak increase. I speak expansion. I speak blessing. I speak revival. Come on somebody, join with me. I speak revival. I speak lasting reformation i speak influence i speak the glory of the lord i speak the hand of god upon this house i speak wisdom ideas creative ventures i speak the power of god the dunamis of the holy spirit the exousia of the basilia of heaven upon you in this season the power the anointing to the wind of god that causes dry bones to come to life is sounding forth from this assembly in this season like the borer said i command that the heavens will fight with you that whatever has warred against your prophetic destiny as a congregation in this city i speak ibra anendo ilalan al ilel ush alabande ikriata under an open heaven i declare in faith that it is already done that those powers are broken that those limitations are destroyed that the heavens over you are open and that this is your season of increase if you believe it shout yes i decree that the heavens are dropping down with sweet dew i decree that what has not worked in this season will work that what has been stolen from you will be restored a thousand times i speak a thousand blessings and the blessing of a thousand times more i speak a thousand miracles and the bible says a small one will be like a thousand i speak the glory the blessing of a nation shall a nation be born in one day says the lord but as soon as zion has travailed in this season as you travail in prayer as you travail in declaration as you rise to command your morning as you attend those watches as you sit on this stand on this pulpit as your pastors and your leaders declare the word of god as you join in in faith and tap into the heavens i speak the blessing of a nation as you travail in the same hour you will bring forth in your finances you will bring forth in your family relationships you will bring forth in the revival movement of the lord in your city you will bring forth you are the head not the tail you are the first not the last you are above and not beneath you are lenders and not borrowers you are in the seat of authority and not the seat of affliction you dictate the agenda and you are not dictated to there is no divination against you no enchantment permitted to work against you kings are coming to the brightness of your eyes and gentiles to the glory of the lord upon you i decree it and i seal it by the blood of the new covenant in the precious name of jesus and if you believe it i want you to put your hands together i want you to shout with a voice of triumph come on shout with a voice of praise shout with a voice of triumph shout with a voice of praise come on shout 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 like it's already done shout like it's already down father we give you praise we give you praise in the name of jesus now i want you to find three people around you give them a high five and say it's working for me tell them it's turning around it's working for me it's changing i can see it i can feel it oh it's a new season it's a new day there's a fresh anointing coming my way it's my season of power and prosperity it's a new season one more time put your hands together for god this message has been brought to you freely by ecclesia kingdom movement to support our ministry and partner with us to increase our impact across the world reach more people and take advantage of more platforms we encourage you to consider making a monthly gift of any amount or one-time gift towards the work of the gospel 
We'd like to thank you in advance for your support and we value your partnership.